Thank you, Emily, for laying the beautiful groundwork for the theme today, for the topic today, which is there's always a story behind the story. And that song, You Raise Me Up, tells us the largest story there is, the story that encompasses everybody everywhere and everything in it. And that larger story is that God is all there is, that there's a power greater than we are in the universe, greater than we are, and we can use it all the time, anytime, and it's here for us. And that's the story that you and I, all of us, are evolving into. But there's layers of us we need to work through and get through to get there. I don't know about you, but I got a lot of stuff to work through. It's just part of the process to open up. Opening our heart isn't always so easy. We have it so bound up to be protected. We don't want to get hurt again. We don't have to want to have to deal with some of those things in the past. Or we have such stories about the past, we don't want to let go of them, and we come all all tied up in string and everything that keeps us closed off to that greater good. Well, I think you'd probably agree with me. I don't know what your relationship with Jesus is. I believe he is the greatest teacher and way shower of all time. But he's definitely the most, at least in my eyes, the most influential person in history. And he was a master storyteller. He knew how to get to people's hearts. He knew that you tell people instructions of what to do to have a better life, or you'd give them different uh, guidelines or whatever you do, and people would go, oh, sure, 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 and then forget them. But you tell people a story, and it's different. He used parables to reach people, and parables are simple stories to tell spiritual truths or realities. And he knew that parables, all his stories, he would always tell stories to crowds of people. He loved to tell stories to individual people, but all the stories he knew meant people where they are. Now, when we listen to stories, when we listen to stories, I don't know about you, but I feel the connection, the good stories. I feel opened. Stories make us feel, I mean, when we go in a theater and people break out in applause together or <laughs> leave this film <laughs> sniffing and crying together because it was a sad one, you know that if it's touched people, that there's a common humanity that belongs to all of us. Stories expand us. So we need to be, of course, open to our own stories, but I want to talk about first the story of our world right now. Does anybody here think we might need a little bit of a new story? The, the, the present one is getting a little exhausting because we're so scattered. Would you agree that we're scattered in the world? I mean, what cracks me up, and I don't know when I first saw this, I was in an airport somewhere and looked up at the TV, and just having the TV on wasn't enough. You had to have ribbons of inf information passing, passing this way and that way. It's not enough to learn one thing at once, right? And news becomes old in about 10 minutes, something new. I mean to really get to the heart of a story. And the heart of a story, as you mentioned, Anne, that's where God lives. That's where good lives. That's where change happens, in the heart. But to get to a heart of the story, it takes time. It takes time to listen to ourselves and others, to the world at large. And how many of us in this busy, hectic world are taking the time because, yes, this world changes. Now, if I look at each one of you, I look right here and see a snapshot of you. Well, most of you, except for the mask, which will be off in a little while, thank goodness. But we see that. But underneath that snapshot, there's not a person here that doesn't have wounds and losses sorrows and joys and magnificent experiences and wonder and happiness. We all have layers of ourselves, but we have to be willing to be present to this moment. Too many people hold on to past mistakes or past joys or past whatever. And here's what our dear friend, our dear friend Rumi says about that. Why do you stay in prison when the door is so wide open? Why do you say there? And his, his buddy after him, 
uh, Fez, and I had two things because I copied this off on a page from the book The Gift, and there was another, you know, you can't read, that's what I love about poems and stories. Hafez says, what do sad people have in common? What do they have in common? It seems they have built a shrine to the past and go there often and do strange wails and worship. What is the beginning of happiness? To not be so religious like that. Don't make shrines about past experiences. Be present in this moment and know there's good available. And then this happened. Right on the same page I copied that was the same poem, a, a poem by Hafez. It says, joy is the royal garment. Joy. Joy is the royal garment. And now every day I could wear that regal coat. Every day I can put on joy. But I so love the common man and feel so for all their label, labor. I often put just a drop of compassion in my eye. Actually, a vast drop of compassion. I truly think that that's where stories lead us, is the place where we can find the compassion for ourselves. We can find compassion for other people. We can learn to be at peace with what is. In, fa in fact, the Dalai Lama said, the greatest gift, and this is a good thing for Valentine's Day, we're looking up gifts. The greatest gift we can give another is our own inner calm and peace. The greatest gift we can give another, give ourselves, give, give the world. And he gave us some practices to do that. He said, and I'll, I'll share those. He said, if we want to enter this day in a place of peace and calm, what do we do? Spend the whole, the whole practice itself. You know, uh, Gandhi said we have to meditate for two hours when we're really busy. But the Dalai Lama said 10 minutes, 10 minutes. So I'm going with him. How about you? <laughs> he said, spend five minutes at the beginning of the day remembering that we all want the same thing. There's not a person in this room, nobody, that doesn't want to be loved and to love and to be happy. Everybody wants the same thing. We can feel those strings that tie up our heart just open up when we remember that. So that's the first thing you do, and just sit for five minutes and remember that. There's not anyone, anyone anywhere that doesn't have that as a need and a want within them. And then the second thing is spend five minutes Breathing in and cherishing yourself. That you, each one of us is a handiwork of spirit, of God, of goodness. Cherish yourself. Cherish who you are and who you're becoming. Cherish the gifts you have and the gifts you appreciate from others. Just cherish that. And then, after you've done that, breathe out cherishing others. Cherish the the people you meet briefly in life, you connect with at a grocery store or pass in line somewhere. Cherish those people. And then the important people in your life, part of your family, your friends, your work experience, the people you're with more often. And then, he said, do the hard part. Bring up someone that rubs you just the wrong way. Cherish, cherish them, too them to. He goes on to say that by doing that wordlessly, and that was important to him, if you do this practice wordlessly, people, you don't tell people you're cherishing them, but if you do this wor wordlessly, you're going to tap in to the appreciation and love and goodness that's already in your own heart. You see, we have the chance to revise our own stories by doing work like that and helping others to do the same. Oftentimes, in this world of change and flux and things happening, we, can, we have thoughts, experiences, perceptions, and they're all changing and fluctuating, our own and others. We can do some amazing work with the help of someone else. Oftentimes, it's too hard to do our own work. And so this is a story that comes from uh, Mark Nepo's book, in his chapter, uh, there's a story behind every story. And it, may, it reminded me of what Jesus said, you are the light of the world. 
That's who we are. We're the light of the world. But this particular story is called, It's Time to Bring Up the Lights. It's time to bring up our light. And oftentimes, we need to look to somebody else to help us. A troubled widower made his way to ask a wise old woman about his troubles. The woman received him, and they walked along a stream. She could see the pain in his face. He began to tremble as he asked, what's the point? What's the point? Is there any meaning to life at all? She invited him to sit on a large stone near the stream, and she took a large branch, and she swirled it in the water. It all depends on you and what it means to you to be alive. In his sorrow, the man dropped his shoulders, and the old woman gave him the branch and said, go on, you touch the water. As he poked the branch in the running stream, there was something comforting about that feeling, the movement of the water in his hand through the branch. She touched his hand and said, you see, you can feel the water without putting your hand in the water. That is what meaning feels like. Let me read that one more time. You see, you can feel the water without putting your hand in the water. And that is what meaning is like. It's a feeling that comes to you, a greater understanding when you know something more that makes you see a situation, a relationship, anything in the world totally differently. And the man grew tender, but he still seemed puzzled. And she said, close your eyes and feel your wife gone now. That you can feel her in your heart without being able to touch her. This. This is how meaning saves us. There's always something more at work. If we open to it, if we're willing to open our hearts and feel the things that are not there, because the most important things in life, in my experience, are invisible. The widower began to cry. The woman put her arms around him. No one knows how to live or how to die. We only know how to love and how to lose and how to pick up the branches of meaning along the way. Pick up the branches of meaning. And that's how we make sense of the stories beyond the story. And if we could think that anything in our life, any sad, any sadness, grief, anything that's gone on wrong, that we can change it for the better if we can infuse it with understanding and meaning. And I believe that's what I really, when I saw that title, I thought, you know, how often do we judge somebody by how they look when we first meet them? Have you ever been judged incorrectly? I mean, how many times do people think they know you when they look at you and make a decision like that, when we all have so many layers inside of us? How many times have we done that to somebody? Oops, we've judged them, and then we learn a little bit about their stories. Because what is true is stories bring out something that's common to us all, whether it's the sadness, the grief, the loss of someone, as in this some story, something that makes us know we're all connected, and there's something deeper in each and every one of us. A little tiny story about judging something by appearance is a story of a little church in a plaza called Santa Rosa. And one morning, the very good cooperative congregation that came on time, <laughs> I'm not pointing any fingers or placing any judgment, I just wanted to say, they were coming in early and coming on time, and they walked in, and as they came in collectively, there was this <gasps> gasp as they looked in the corner where the statue of Jesus has always stood. There he was, but some vandals had broken in and broken his hands off. And everyone was so 
concerned and upset. And right after the service, the uh, priests got together, the parishioners, a committee of parishioners, to find out who these vandals were and to get a new statue. We had to get this fixed. And the following Sunday, the parishioners walked in on time again. And <laughs> this time, there was another gasp. <gasps> because the same statue was there, but it had around its neck hanging a sign. It was written in very carefully printed letters that said, I have no hands but yours. That's kind of a God bumpy thing, I think. And so this Valentine's, I mean, you can use your hands like this all you want. Thank you, Reverend Janet, for your beauty. You're beautiful, um, up-leveled consciousness about the Super Bowl game. We're going to be yelling and screaming. I think it's a great way to let off emotions, too, but it's fun to have that. But as we enter into this Valentine's Day, which is a day of love and understanding, remember, it's not the size of the gift you bring to the world. It's the energy, the hand, the love, the appreciation and compassion that we use. So for each of us today, I'd like you to just say with me, what did I write down? I wrote something very simple, but I can't remember it. Uh, something new and wonderful comes into my life today. Let's say that. Something new and wonderful comes into my life today. And you know, we can't be whole, perfect, and complete unless what we wish for ourselves, we wish for others. A prayer isn't enough if we just say it for ourselves. We want to say it for other people, too. So I want you to say, just to the person next to you or just around you or speak it out into the ethers, something new and wonderful comes into your life today. I know something new and wonderful comes into your life today. Let's say that. I know something new and wonderful comes into your life today. And say it to somebody else, because I can tell that just the energy of the room lifted and lifted. See what happens. It feels so good. It feels so good. So my wish for each of us is to do something that makes us feel alive. Bring beauty, wonder, excitement, joy, peace, understanding, forgiveness into this world. Because together, every one of us is going to make this place more beautiful, more exciting, more understanding and bring more meaning to each and everything. I love you all, and I'm glad we're in this community together to do our work for ourselves, for this community, for our world. Go Rams. Yeah. <laughs>